Olin, and salutations to the Truth Corps, whoever and wherever you may be on the planet. I'm reaching out today with a message, a signal, regarding the 15th anniversary edition of Not in His Image. The official publication date is September 18th. In the description, I provide a link to order from the publisher, if that is your desire. I'm also going to provide, I believe, another link to order from the publisher in the UK. Chelsea Green now has a branch in London, and it may be possible for those of you in the UK and Europe to order from there, which would be perhaps more convenient. Otherwise, of course, it can be ordered from Amazon.com. But books that are ordered and purchased from the publisher generate a little bit more or better income for the author. For the first edition of 2006, I wrote an introduction. The title of it was The Case for Awe. And now, 15 years later, I've written a preface for the new edition. And the title of that is the same as the title of this upload, The Once and Future Heresy. I took specific care to choose this title. It carries a certain allusion, allusion, not illusion, It is actually what we today call a meme. And it's a powerful and ancient meme. Specifically, it comes from Arthurian legend, the stories of Parzival, Galahad, and the Knights of the Round Table, centered upon the legendary figure of King Arthur. So all of the main male characters in that vast body of legend are heroes, warriors. Some of those knights in shining armor were, as I have explained, part of a guardian corps who were committed to protecting the mysteries or the company of the grail. So they were In some instances, they can, in some instances, be associated with the Grail legend. Parsifal, of course, Gawain, and King Arthur and others. Those who protected the Grail, or the diaspora of teachers from the mysteries, formed a warrior caste. It seems to have been established in Wales around 450 A.D. And those were real events and real people. And out of the events of that time, the legends of the quest for the Holy Grail developed. People of that time, and for some centuries afterward, I would say, drew upon a pre-existing tradition whose origin cannot be exactly determined But the presence of this tradition is strong in ancient lore, for instance in Greece, but not only Greece. And there is much evidence that the people of those times, pre-Christian era, in the pagan world, believed that immortality is not for everyone. They didn't universally assign an afterlife to everyone. According to that ancient belief, only heroes had a kind of afterlife or life after death. In some manner, the hero survived. I've written about this in my book, The Hero, Manhood and Power. It's not exactly as if the hero continued to live with the same identity although in some cases that appears to have been uh, 
a legend, for instance, Heracles, a great Greek hero, was said to have survived in Hades, in the underworld, and he could be consulted as an oracle if you went to one of the many places or shrines dedicated to him. The basic significance of this belief is that the hero contains an excess of vital force, which is what makes him a hero. And when he dies, due to the fact that the vital force has not been exhausted, it continues to live on. So, this tradition survived into the Middle Ages, and at the time when the Arthurian cult came into existence in England and Wales, it passed over to the heroes of that genre, you see. So it is said that King Arthur was the once and future king. Now, there is a book called The Once and Future King. It was written by T.H. White, and it was published in 1958, and it's a modern retelling of a book written in in 1485 by Sir Thomas Mallory called Le Mort d'Arthur, or The Death of Arthur. So, the once and future theme or meme suggests something powerful, and I wanted to bring that connotation into the book for its 15th anniversary edition. Therefore, I used this language, the once and future heresy. It applies to something that was lost or died or was destroyed at a previous time, but ultimately can never be destroyed. And so the importance that it once had returns in the future. And the future I'm talking about is now. So to put it fast and easy, I have blended something that you might call an heroic overtone into the new edition. And you'll find it in certain passages, as well as in the preface. So without further ado, here it is, for your listening pleasure. Not in His Image came out in November 2006, as I was approaching my 61st birthday. On that day, December 3rd, a review appeared in the Sunday Literary Supplement of the Los Angeles Times. The reviewer averred that I had achieved my stated mission to complete Nietzsche's critique of Christianity, quote, that crapulent faith, unquote. So far, so good. Then he discounted me for delving into the dubious terrain of paranormal psychology and the E.T. UFO phenomenon. It is the only mainstream review I have ever received. To this day, there are precious few even in the alternative media who openly dare discuss me or my work. The Gnostic message is the biggest taboo on the planet. Always has been always will be. It is the once and future heresy. At the winter solstice of that year, I was in Gaucin, Spain, a spectacular white village with a view, elevation 1,800 feet, across the Straits of Gibraltar to the mountains of Africa, where I had been staying off and on for some years. There, at a remote spot I called Infinity Ridge, Something had happened in 2003 that set me on course to write this book. Later, I jokingly described the event by analogy to a telephone switchboard. A call came in from humanity, 
asking to talk to the mother planet. The switchboard operator, yours truly, replied, Stay on the line, and I'll put you through to her. I leave it to you, noble reader, to investigate how that one-liner has played out. Subheading, Against Authority Over the years I have often reflected on the difficulties posed by a book that tackles not merely one or two large topics, but half or a dozen or more, a big no-no in publishing. A book titled, say, Against Patriarchy, would already be a lot to handle. Add to that pre-Christian European history, shamanism, the mysteries, eco-psychology, noetics, Gaia theory, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the ET UFO phenomena, and a few other mind-toppling topics which escape me at the moment. Then throw in a complex myth that recounts the biography of the living earth and, well, I can only assume that the challenge of reading such a monstrous tome must in some respects be proportional to the challenge of writing it. Thankfully, many people have assured me of what I hardly dared presume. The switchboard operator did actually make the connection. I could not ask for more. This book initiates bonding with the wisdom goddess and addresses what works against that bonding. Almost all the feedback I've received attests to the same takeaway as if the responses had been cut and pasted from a single document. Readers unanimously assert that not in his image liberated them from decades of religious indoctrination. It delivered the coup de grace to patriarchy. My attack on patriarchy often conflates it with salvationist ideology. This tactic was central to my aim, but was it overkill? The word search function showed me 47 uses of that word, patriarchy, but reduced in this book to 28. Even then I wondered if overuse of the term might undermine its impact. To defy patriarchy successfully requires defining it accurately. Had I done that? Fortunately, events of the day in 2021 reinforce my argument. The Gnostics warned about the deceit and subversion of the archons, a.k.a. the authorities or rulers, those who govern. Patriarchy means far more than governance by or dominance of men. Divine paternalism is a cognate of patriarchy, which itself is a generic term for the enforcement of authority in all forms and guises. For instance, the authority of the transhumanist technocrats pushing the Great Reset. Dominator culture, another cognate, is by no means the sole prerogative of men. Not in his image cites a few feminist scholars, and those passages, those passages can stand as written. But today I regard feminism as a perfidious and tiresome strain of cultural Marxism, totally opposed to the true cause of the divine feminine. Social leadership by men is not categorically wrong, but with the wrong men it is, with the wrong women even worse. The Great Reset is the endgame of patriarchal authority and certainly the most tyrannical deceit in human history. The aberration of theocracy among the ancient Hebrews plays forward into the Kovyet regime, my neologism, of the globalist overlords. The ultimate goal of the Zedekim, who are holier than thou, is to dictate to others how they shall live and enforce their mandate with lies, deceit, threats, and genocidal violence. Historically, the teachers of the mysteries were on the front line of that assault, but the essential message of the mysteries survives in this book. Can it make a difference now, at the moment it is most needed? 
Subheading, Mystic Testimony. After 2006, I spent 11 more years in the Serenia de Ronda, a sorcerer's paradise in the brutally beautiful heart of Andalusia. Visitors came and went, but most of that time I lived in virtual retreat, wandering the arroyos and mesas in the majestic company of vultures. I did not anticipate the richness and magnitude of what was coming my way through contact with the Aeonic Mother, Gaia Sophia. Even today, it dazzles me. Ever since then, I have held the line of communication open. I have spoken and written at length about my outrageous claim to communicate directly with the mind of the planet. I have always insisted that transactions with the planetary animal mother, Pam, a term of endearment, are not unique and exclusive to myself. My leading intent as an exponent of the living Gnosis today is to guide and teach others to do the same. In 2006, I was somewhat guarded about aspects of the exposition based directly on my mystical investigations, as they might be called. The introduction stated, quote, I present scholarly research side by side with the evidence of my own mystical and shamanic experiences, end quote. But I did not follow up with first-person language in those passages where I describe the organic light, cognitive ecstasy, and other intimate details of Gnostic practice. In this edition, I have been rather less coy, but still discreet concerning my experimentation with the telestic method of the mysteries. Why be shy? Two reasons, basically. First, direct encounter with the telluric power of the wisdom goddess is not given to everyone, and handling it correctly is a demanding discipline. The grail selects its own, Fulfram von Eschenbach wrote in Parsifal around 1220 AD. That being so, any description of the ecstatic trance, theoria, the beholding of the mysteries, risks sounding elitist. And I do not want to foster that impression in a way that might discourage others. Second, that sublime encounter obliterates the ordinary mental boundaries of the human animal, and the download that comes with it is fast and vast, exceeding the retention of the individual who receives it. This is precisely why Gnostic seers perform the ritual in groups, as I have also done on some occasions. All that being so, I have worked diligently to make the encounter with the wisdom goddess accessible by parallel and alternative practices. Planetary Tantra presents the toolkit for grounded and provable interaction with the PSI, the plenary sovereign intelligence of the earth. Fortunately, I now share both the method and results of autogenic training with a network of student allies around the world. Footnote. Autogenics is a technique of subject-world interaction created by German psychiatrist J.H. Schultz in 1932, commonly called biofeedback training. The current platform for this purpose is nemata.org, the Sofianic School of Arts and Sciences, launched in September 2018. Subheading, Revision Points. I've not changed this book in any basic way, but I have revised three chapters, reworked passages here and there, and factored in some new elements. The role of the Aeon Christos in Episode 2 of The Fallen Goddess Scenario remains as it was, but Chapter 14 now features a different Aeon, Ecclesia, the Symbiont. 
The intervention of the other aeons to support Sophia in the management of terrestrial life does not change, but the agency that accomplishes it does. The action of the symbiont has far-reaching implications for the issue of species self-identity in chapter 23, also modified quite extensively. I revisit the Christ Christos conundrum and double down on the deceit of universality, that is, the claim that collective good can be achieved by appealing to a generic sense of transracial humanity in disregard of genetic differences, cultural contrasts, and racial distinctions. Chapter 22, Divine Imagination, is retitled Sophia's Correction. This event may finally come to definition at the moment when the transhumanist overlords, cohorts of the Archons, threaten to remake humanity in their image. Quote, to change what it means to be human, end quote, as declared in the mission statement of the Great Reset. The arconic lie that humanity is made in his image has failed on religious grounds, but the dementia behind it persists. The bizarre trope of the aborted fetus, unique to Gnostic cosmology, is now demonstrable in pharmaceutical elixirs that contain fetal matter. Planet-wide vaccination is the ritual of the Archontic Eucharist. The transhumanist psychopaths intend to run the social order on a data operating system that cancels and overrides the operation of natural human intelligence. Gnostics warned about the consummation of the work of the Archons. And now, well, brace for impact, here it is. Subheading, Divine Birthright. The 2006 edition of Not in His Image contains the oldest published version of the Fallen Goddess scenario, comparable to legacy software. After at least 20 reworkings over a dozen years, I released FGS 1.0 in August 2020. See sophianicmyth.org, introduced by a four-minute video to receive the nine episodes of FGS 1.0. The current iteration of the sacred narrative brings it to FGS 7.7. .7. Within the limits of this preface, I cannot provide even a hint of how the narrative evolved that far, what such a progression entailed, or who is engaged with me in elaborating it today. Likewise, I cannot offer in this revision more than a few allusions regarding how Gnostic teachings are relevant to the coronavirus hoax and the alien mind technocratic nightmare of the Great Reset. I rely on my noble readers to draw the obvious connections. The Sophianic myth is the sacred birthright of the human species. It is, of course, a vast mythopoetic scenario to be embraced by heart and learned with commitment. It can inspire all races to achieve the standard of the anthropos, ariete, the excellence innate to our species. That commitment carries a moral force that is paramount and incomparable. In the 2006 edition, in the introduction, I cite Nietzsche, quote, Wisdom is a woman who never loves anyone but a warrior, end quote. When I first read that line at the age of 16, I did not know who the wisdom woman is. Now I do, and many, many also do. Since Not in His Image came out in 2006, I have realized more than ever that the role of the warrior is imperative if Sophia's correction is to be accomplished. Extensive studies in historical revision, that is, the investigation of alleged events in the accepted historical narrative, 
weighed against the factual evidence that supports or refutes that narrative, have reinforced that conviction. Today I argue for the action of a warrior class capable of eliminating psychopaths and the enemies of life by whatever means required. That would be the completion of the destiny of Parsifal. How it might play out, I cannot say. Finally, I am merely an ancestral bard announcing the swan song of Kali Yuga. A passage from the Greek tragedy Agamemnon, written about 458 B.C. by Aeschylus, expresses my feelings as this book comes to the world in its fifteenth year. I declare on authority the auspicious venture of men who command with genuine power. For the age that gave me birth and lives in me inspires me divinely to daring persuasion, the prowess of the warrior's song. <laughs>